Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live, the noon show. Uh, this is uh, Energy 808, <laughs> the cutting edge today with uh, Marco Mangelsdorf, my co-host, and Randy Iwasi, the chair of the PUC. Uh, we are so delighted to have you both here. Thank you, uh, Jay. My pleasure. Great to be here with you. And Marco, say hi. Say hi, Jay. Well, thank you so much for having me again. And Randy Wasse, uh, yeah, warm welcome. It's uh, great to have you uh, the week, the very week after the big news of, of last week. So uh, I do so appreciate you joining us today. Thank yeah, you, Marco. Let's talk about that news. Uh, you've, you've given notice. You're about to leave the end of the year. Tell us the circumstances. Tell us what's going to happen now. Well, you know, it's, it's been something I've been thinking about a, a long time, uh, Jay. Uh, my wife, who is a school principal, retired in June. Uh, there were things that happened to us personally over the course of this year that made me reflect. And I'm going to be 71 on December 1st. And I decided, you know, I think it's time to just spend time with the family. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever years uh, you have left on Earth, spend it with people uh, of your family. Well, it's a, an historic moment as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure Marco agrees. Um, you've served uh, through the uh, EGA administration, first administration. Yes. Um, you've had some very, very high profile cases, higher perhaps than anything that I can remember in the past uh, as chair of the PUC. You've had changes in the PUC composition. I mean, gee, I mean, it's been a real adventure, hasn't it? Well, I'm glad you call it an adventure. I, <laughs> it's been interesting. It's been an interesting adventure. Yes. <laughs> what What are the high points for you, Randy? Well, well I think the high point. Uh, some of the high points for me are, first of all, you know, getting the staff hired, and uh, seeing them. They're very new. They're growing. Uh, they're energetic. Um, I said yesterday or the other day to them. Uh, I hope and I believe that it's true that uh, you will be committed to public service. It's not going to make you financially rich, but it will enrich you in so many other ways. And I think, I think that's, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm quite proud of. The second is um, how the PUC is functioning now. Um, it is, it is um, the, the commissioners are interacting, the staff is, are interact, is interacting. They're working as a team, which is what we need. Uh, the PUC, when you're dealing with a doc, it is not about I. It's the old, the proverbial, there's no I in team. And we're functioning now better as a team. We need to because we're young. And um, uh, those are some of the things I'm proud of. Um, anything that sticks in your craw over the past four years? It sticks in my craw. You mean I, I, I found... So the low points, if you will. Well, one was um, um, the disappointment with the uh, nomination uh, of Tom Gorak. Mm -hmm. I think Tom was uh, one of the most uh, qualified uh, commissioners nominee we ever had. How that all played out um, was a very, very much a disappointment for me. Uh, fortunately, we had Jay Griffin to step up and take his place. Uh, well, you can't ever take Tom's place, nor can anyone take Jay's place, but you know, he. He moved into that uh, vacancy and filled it well uh, with the experience that he had at the commission. Um, that, that was, I think, uh, the, the low point for me, to, uh, the disappointment for me. Mm -hmm. And now you have two commissioners, uh, two new commissioners. They both came on during your watch. How have they changed? How is the, you know, the, mm, you want to call it the, the character and composition uh, of the PUC changed by virtue of their coming on? Well, Jennifer, I, I spoke some about Jay. Um, um, he brings a wealth of experience, knowledge, technical skills. Um, Jennifer is just a bunch of energy. She is a joy uh, to be uh, working with. Um, just so energetic, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, very much wanting to learn, very much wanting to interact uh, in a harmonious way. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I truly appreciate that. Uh, the, people always use the word consensus, and I think I mentioned it once before to you. Mm -hmm. um, the commission is not about consensus. As I told Jay, I told Jennifer, it's about how you feel about a case. That is your name 
going on that decision. You sign off. That is your reputation. And so if you want to uh, dissent, if you want to write a concurring opinion, feel free to do so. Don't feel pressured that we have to be unanimous because it is, after all, your reputation on the line. And she's taken that to heart. She concurred in one decision already. And, um, but it, we're working very well uh, together. And uh, you know, I won't, I won't have the time left to spend. I'll have a little bit of time left to spend with them. But I'm going to miss them. I'm going to miss the staff. What I, what I hear is that you're leaving the PUC in, in good condition, and you're happy with that. Am I right? Yes. Well, you're hearing it from me, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, you know, there's, there's much more to go, uh, Jay. Like I said, the commission is young. The staff is young. And uh, that's where a Tom Gorak or a, uh, uh, a Jay Griffin come in, as well as the veterans on the staff. They bring institutional knowledge. And I've been around government now for 38 years, and I realize and I know that those with institutional uh, memories are extremely valuable to an agency. So they're going to have to mentor uh, the younger uh, staff, and I think they're doing it. Um, we are. We survived, uh, you know, the, the massive Nextera case. This year alone, we had, I think, 10 uh, rate cases. Uh, those are uh, very time consuming, and the staff was very new. They went into it, they're doing it. And so it's been a very busy year. People say, well, Nextera is gone. And uh, Nextera was one case. It consumed a lot of oxygen in the room for that period of time. But these other cases, just as important for the long haul, for the rate payer, for the public, um, they worked on it. We also move forward with uh, those cases that I, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, contain the blueprint as we go forward uh, for our energy future. So, and they're working on it. Mm -hmm. And it continues to move forward. Marco, uh, I know you have many questions. Why don't you ask your questions? Oh, thank you, Jay. So, Randy, you mentioned Dexter, which, of course, uh, took up a lot of oxygen in uh, the year and a half or so that it was in play in terms of its um, desire to acquire Hawaiian Electric Industries. I wanted to ask you, given the thumbs-down decision on that purchase and, and your long time uh, working and competing in the public arena, how much of an ingrained resistance do you think actually exists here in our state? to an out-of-state company such as Nextera purchasing a major Hawaii-based regulated company? I don't, you know, Marco, maybe 40, 50 years ago, that would have been a statement that had some degree of truth, a substance to it. I can tell you that uh, in the Nextera case, it was not for the PUC, and I can think, I think I can speak for the governor. It was not a matter of them being from the mainland. Uh, it was a matter of whether or not what they presented to the PUC uh, comported with law, that you provided the information that we needed, the facts that we needed, the assurances that we needed, and uh, making compromises if necessary, and that didn't happen. Uh, we just approved the merger of Cincinnati Bell and Hawaiian Tel, um, which, which was a mainland company, if you listen to the commercial of the Hawaiian Tel's competitor. But um, um, no, we're not adverse. Uh, we understand that this is a global economy. This is a small place called Hawaii, and that um, there are times, perhaps more often than not, depending on the industry, when there needs to be different uh, perspectives and different ownership. But I can tell you that in the next Terra case, the, the resistance, if you want to call it that, did not come from anything cultural. I know I, I, I mentioned um, to one of the witnesses, uh, why should I trust you? That is a question, Marco, I would ask of anyone um, who is wanting to take over a major utility as Hawaiian Electric. and. Um, you know, I mentioned to him, I think it was Eric Gleason, that um, uh, there were, you know, we, we had promises made during the uh, monarchy 
We had promises made during the Republic. We had promises made during ter the territorial days. We had promises made at statehood. And, and many promises were not kept. Um, but that is not so much a function of you being a mainland company as opposed to you being a company that we can, for me, I'm using my words, that I can trust, that if we approve this merger, you will, benef you will work to the benefit of the rate pair, uh, specifically, and the people of Hawaii in general. So if, um, if it comes up again, if, there's an, if either Nextera or someone else comes up again, by that analysis, you, you would possibly consider them, or rather, the PUC that you're leaving <laughs> yes. might possibly consider them. Well, if you recall what we said in our, um, um, I think it was dismissal without prejudice was how, how we phrased it, and that was done for certain reasons. Um, in, in, in my case, I, I believe that we should have rejected the, uh, the uh, application. Mm -hmm. But um, nevertheless, we did what we did. We came forward in that decision with a set of guidelines that would guide the commission in the future if there were applicants for a merger or wow. an acquisition. That's valuable. Yes, and it was, it's valuable not only to the commission, but you're, you know, you're, you're in law, uh, Jay. You, you know and we're taught that if you're going to um, ask somebody to do something and penalize them if they don't, you got to give them notice. These are the rules. You play by the rules, everything's okay. You don't play by the rules, things are not okay. Mm -hmm. So we put out the guidelines for anyone to see. So if any company comes in and seeks to purchase Hawaiian Electric or even Hawaiian Tel, uh, these are guidelines we're going to refer to. Valuable. Um, can I shift for a minute, Marco, and just ask about uh, LNG? LNG, um, you know, there was an effort. I suppose Nextera might have uh, relied more on LNG than the existing players. Um, but where, where, where did LNG go during your term on the uh, PUC? Well, it didn't go anywhere. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I came in, interestingly enough, and, and maybe Marco or per perhaps others in the uh, energy industry would disagree with me. Uh, when I came in, I thought uh, LNG was a transition fuel. That's three, four years ago now. I sit here today and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, maybe, maybe that's not a fuel we need to rely on. Um, with the, um, maybe, although it's more expensive, maybe we can look at biofuel. Uh, maybe we can look at uh, um, solar, wind, or renewables with battery as, as a quote unquote fillers, for lack of a better term for me, um, that their, uh, the urgency that appeared to have been there when I started just four years ago, uh, to me is no longer there, not in my mind. I think there are other ways we can go. And the, the question now is, you know, when we were talking about those LNG project, projects or proposals that did not come to the PUC but was floating out there, we're talking about a 20-year uh, lifespan. Uh, that's, not a, that's not the Halawai Bridge. That's the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, that's a long bridge. <laughs> and uh, do we need to go that long? Do we need to, uh, so that you can recover your capital costs? Uh, is it necessary to have, to rely on LNG? And like I said, today, as I sit here four years later, I don't feel that there's that great sense of urgency. Marco? I'm gonna ask something of a provocative question, Randy, and I know this is on an open docket, so I'm not gonna ask you to get into any particular details, but the, the uh, performance-based rate-making, performance-based regulation, how, how much of a potential existential threat is that to a company, an investor-owned utility like Hawaiian Electric, and how important do you feel it is that, that the commission, uh, after you depart, that the commission get it right, however you want to define right? Well, that's a good question, Marco, and I, I'm glad you had a qualifier, however we define right, because I, I don't know if there's ever going to be a right. Things keep evolving. But, you know, I, 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 and, I and, and Jay knows that from when I first began here. Um, so let me start this way. I do not believe that the utility uh, is uh, a b big, bad animal, that, um, or that the utility is an enemy. I really believe 
that we are, uh, given the isolation of Hawaii, uh, all in one canoe, that we have to work together, that we've got to do all that we can to get all parties on board, and then act um, to move enforcement if we have to, where one is very intransigent. In the case of PBR, I am um, heartened by the fact that the utilities are actively participating in the PBR docket, uh, in the technical conferences that we have. We need them on board. We need them to be a participant in um, this uh, a process. Can we get it right? I will say this. I think we'll be on the target board when this process ends. Well, it's, it'll never end. When this process comes to a point where we're going to have to move decisions out. But as I said, it is an evolutionary process. We're going to learn from what we have here. I think Marco knows that there have been efforts in other states to get close to performance-based rate making, or some other name that they call it. No state has gotten it right yet, quote, right. No state has, has it perfect. And what we can do is look at what their experience is, and we are, and, and take from them what can work here. Mm. Um, we always hear that Hawaii is a unique place. And in the case of, of our energy needs, production of energy, distribution of energy, we are unique. We cannot shoot off excess energy to Nevada. We cannot import energy when we need it from California. We're self-reliant. And so it is more important that we get as close to the uh, target center as we can, and we're working to do it, and we have good minds on it. We have stakeholders involved. I, sincerely, I was sincere when I said to them, we need all of your input because none of us here has the answer for everything. Each of you has a bit of an answer. Uh, and that we also, as the PUC, from the PUC side, understand that each of you represents a special interest. Um, and so you will articulate and advocate for that special interest. That you're, you're not necessarily looking at the broader uh, perspective. We have to bring that. And so that's, that's the mindset that we have entered into this PBR process and others, uh, Marco, DER, PSIP, um, DR, all of it, I, 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 I am sincere in my statement that we need the input of all the stakeholders because no one person is omniscient. And, and all these factors somehow play in, in the big question is whether we can reach our goal, our 100% renewable goal by 2045. And I, and I wonder if you could discuss that. Do you think we will reach that goal? And what has to happen? What are the factors that would play into whether we do or not? I, I am very optimistic. When I came in uh, four years ago, I thought the goals were aspirational. I am now more of the belief that it can be done. And, um, you know, we just came back from Kauai uh, about two weeks ago. On some days, that island is 97% renewable for a certain period of time. Uh, the Big Island and Maui, I believe, are over 50% or close to 50%, and, uh, or somewhere, somewhere thereabouts. It is this island, as I think I said at the last program, mm -hmm. that we're going to have to really work at it. Uh, this island, Oahu, with four-fifths of the population, nearly a million people, uh, with not much land area, and you're going to have, and you always will run into now, not in my backyard, you don't put up the windmill, don't put up the solar farm. Um, so this island is, I am very hopeful, I believe we will achieve 100% renewable, even if the formula is adjusted. You know, Henry Curtis talks about the formula allowing for uh, a whole lot of fossil fuel. Um, so even if that formula is adjusted, these islands can reach it. I believe that. I sincerely believe that. In four years, we went from no battery to battery. and and. and you know, it, it's a quick changing field. It's evolving. It's sometimes revolutionary. We're going to get there. It's this island. And what can we do? I think it's what's going to be more important on this island than anywhere else. Things like energy efficiency, things like demand response. Uh, we don't have hydro. 
um, uh, being looked at? Can we look at Lake Wilson? Mm. Um, can we look at elsewhere on this island for pump hy hydro pump storage? Can we do any of that? And how much of the need will that address, I'm talking hydro, if uh, it's done? But, um, you know, then we're talking about offshore wind and all that stuff for o Oahu. Well, at this point, as I sit here today, it's good luck. <laughs> you know, I think I've told others, we'll get the Navy's approval first. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we can talk about that, but we've got to look at what is existing now and making room for what will be uh, invented in the future. Mm. But this island is going to be more difficult. You know, Randy, there's a certain tension between rooftop solar for individual residences and community solar and solar on top of uh, condos and all that. Um, it's an inherent tension, and it's a legal tension, it's a regulatory tension. How do you see that working over the next few years on the way to 2045? Well, you know, what? on this island, um, uh, we are trying, we got so much, uh, we have a lot on this island already. Uh, we're probably going to need um, uh, utility scale storage for some of the other, uh, excuse me, yeah, storage and, and solar mm -hmm. farms yeah. or wind farms when we expand into things like community-based renewables. Um, we certainly do not want to um, slow down the um, uh, residential rooftops. That is why, because um, be, I, I believe that if you put, if you are in CBRE, if you are a resident with solar, or in, in CBRE, a renter or person in a condo, and you, you are participating now in renewable energy, you become what Bob Oshiro called the messengers, the sparrows. You become a believer in renewables. And uh, you become the messengers for renewables, the way to commit to renewables. So I think there's room for both. Uh, it's not an either or. But like I said, with respect to uh, the solar rooftop, um, we, we certainly had no intent or desire to, to bring it to an end. When we closed the NEM program, there were other factors involved. But we then immediately substituted community uh, uh, customer self-supply, customer grid supply. Now we have customer grid supply plus. Now we have NEM plus. So we're trying to, again, um, incentivize people to go out there and put solar on your roof. Second, with a, a, um, customer grid uh, service, CGS. Uh, we, we did that because now we want to see if people would be incentivized to utilize battery storage. Because I think for the short term, and maybe for the medium term, especially if battery prices come down, that is going to be something that we have to do. Do you have a message to the legislature on that point? No, because it won't do any good. <laughs> <laughs> but because I know I know they've been um, going back and forth on uh, the credit, and um, you know, they 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 the credit helped, uh, and still does help the federal credit and the state credit for solar, and uh, take the lesson from there. Mm -hmm. But I think I think um, for the short term and the me, uh, me, middle term, media intermediate term. That is something we got to look at: is, is battery uh, storage at the home level, at the at the utility level, and um, and just keep plowing ahead. This, again, I use the word: this is an evolutionary process. Don't stop. Don't be discouraged. Um, keep trying, and the solutions or the programs, the innovative programs, they're not going to come from the private public sector. They're going to come from the private sector. We didn't get to the moon because the, um, somebody in um, the Department of uh, Energy oh, didn't have that. Somebody in the federal government discovered and built the rocket. Everything came from the private sector. And so this is the meshing of public-private sector with the president and the, and, the, and the Congress, with NASA pushing these programs, buying things, asking the private sector to produce Velcro, produce uh, um, Teflon. Uh, all that stuff, that comes from the private sector. It's going to take that working together. Mm -hmm. Marco, uh, you follow, uh, gee, you follow solars so carefully. I can hear your ears peek, peek up, perk up in this discussion. You, you had an article, what, in this morning's paper 
um, about the uh, number of installs on the Big Island and on Oahu. Uh, can, can you, uh, you want to formulate a question on this to Randy? Sure. I, I first, I guess, I, I want to thank you, Randy, and and uh, Jenny, and and Jay, Lorraine, uh, Tom, and Mike Champley uh, for over the years since you've been there in the position of the PUC chair for the past four years or so. I, I really do get that you have made it an important priority to continue to support rooftop solar and the, the creativity that the commission has shown and receptiveness to hear from, uh, from the various um, energy stakeholders. Uh, I really do believe that Hawaii has been kind of setting the new standard in terms of what comes after net energy metering, which uh, was great when we had it. It was necessary, in my opinion. It was necessary for it to go away. So I, I first just wanted to thank you for for your continued support and your continued efforts to to promote a fair and cost-effective rooftop solar. And uh, and now we're running out of time here, but kind of taking the macro, you know, 20,000-foot level question, when everyone comes into a new position, you have some ideas in terms of how it's going to play out, what you're going to be doing. My question to you, Randy, is what has surprised you the most? What have been some of the things that have been surprising you the most over the past four years in terms of your position there as PUC chair? You know, Marco, when you're an old codger like me, <laughs> and having been in politics, I don't think there's much that really um, um, shocked me or surprised me. I was um, very much discouraged and surprised by the uh, uh, what happened with the Tom Gorak confirmation and how that all played out. But short of that, um, you know, get, getting um, uh, letters or phone calls from elected officials or people from the utilities or people from the uh, uh, special interest groups, that was expected. And um, so I think the, most, the thing that pleasantly surprised me was how committed, you know, when I started, Marco, we had 35, including uh, people, including uh, administrative staff, we are now up to 59. But at the time of uh, uh, of um, Nextero, we may have had uh, uh, 43 people, including the administrative staff. And what pleasantly surprised me was how hard they worked, and and their commitment to doing well. Uh, we had uh, Tom was the chief counsel in that case. We had Caroline Ishida, who had just come on board. We had um, um, a Mark, uh, who had just come on board. And then we had um, a Mike Azama, uh, who had, had been there a while. But Caroline and Mark, um, they, they acted like pros and, and helped us tremendously. And as we grew the agency, the commitment of these young people, millennials are often maligned, uh, but you cannot I don't, at least, question their commitment uh, to a, a progressive social values for our, our society. And that has been um, a source of uh, wonderment to me. You know, Randy, um, the Energy Policy Forum lost Sharon Moriwaki and the Senate gained her. Yes, yes. Okay. Makaimaki High School alumni. Is that right? Yes. Okay, small town. Congratulations, Sharon. <laughs> And Sherilyn Wee was selected by a search committee yes, yes. Uh, to be the new um, executive, if you will, of the Energy Policy Forum. And you've followed it. You've, you've seen them, and you know, you know the kind of things they've been doing. What role do you see the Energy Policy Forum playing as we go forward? Continue to articulate as a neutral body, although it's hard to say that they're neutral given the membership that you have. But, you know, it... It is important, <clears throat> uh, let me talk about my PUC perspective. It is important for us looking out when we, we have issues before us to get, to look at, okay, that organization will be, pr present a neutral point of view. This organization will present this point of view, that will present a contrary point of view. The contrary, the, the pro push backward and forward between 
uh, interest groups, that's a given. What's rare is um, an organization that is going to look at issues in a, uh, first of all, holistic way, but in a neutral way, uh, and not with an ideology. That, to me, is important, to have that kind of an organization. And then going to the legislature and presenting that information. Um, like, like they're at the legislature, they're going to have people uh, with their special interests. But you need uh, someone or organization or organizations there that can present this straightforward objective. This is this, this is that. Uh, you, you know, this may be controversial. You take the thing with uh, GMOs. You don't know who to believe anymore because you have one side saying this, you have one side saying this, and somebody's got to be in the middle saying, okay, this is what everything is all about. Same mm -hmm. thing with climate change. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, I think, is very important, not only for the energy field and this organization, but I think in general, so that there can be some kind of civil, civil objective discourse when you're dealing with important issues. Mm -hmm. One last question for me, and then We'll, we'll have to wrap up. Uh, and, and that is, uh, gee, you've been in government service, as you mentioned, for 30, 30 years, 35? No, 38, I think. 38, yeah, I thought but I who's counting? Yeah. And <laughs> you've served in the legislature for some years. Um, you've uh, served, obviously, in the PUC. Uh, you ran for governor back a few years ago. It wasn't that long ago. Um, and you're in and around government your whole professional legal career. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, it's an irresistible question to ask now at the end of your term at the PUC, um, could you go back? Would you be interested in some other position? Uh, is there another chapter in this journey? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I'm leaving uh, for the very reason I started to tell you about, and that is my family. Um, they sacrificed... Um, so much for me. And, you know, we lost our, our, our middle son in May. Sorry and, to hear that. Uh, uh, thank you. And he, you start to think, you know, there's that thing, I've given enough here. Uh, I would like to give more if I could, but I, I, I'm thankful for the privilege that I was afforded, first by the electorate in my district, secondly by um, Governors Cayetano, uh, Abercrombie, and um, uh, Ige. Uh, to allow me to serve, but I think this is it. Um, I think it's time. What is what is it? Um, what was it, General McCartney? You just fade away. You know, it's time to fade away. <laughs> we'll still talk to you. I hope oh, you yes. still talk to us. <laughs> oh yes. I'm sure you have a lot of opinions that you would be more free to discuss after your term is over. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, Marco, I'm leaving the farewell to you because I know you're, well, you know, highly interested and articulate on this point. And I'd like you to sort of speak for both of us on a farewell to Randy. Well, I think we could go on for a considerable period, uh, longer, longer minutes, gentlemen, but uh, all good things do come to an end. So I just want to thank you very sincerely, Randy, for your time today and uh, even more importantly for your public service over the decades and more uh, approximately time-wise your very good, strong stewardship of the Public Utilities Commission. And I can only hope that the, the next chair, whether it's Jenny, whether it's Jay, or whether it's um, a new commissioner, that they do as uh, competent, capable, and uh, passionate a job as, as you've done. So uh, thank you again so much for, for being with us, and all the best to you and your family. Thank you, Marco. Amen. Amen to all of that. We wish you well in all particulars, Randy. Thank you, Jay. Thank, Thank you, you so very, much. Thank you very much, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.